Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 11, is one of those short little parables that our Lord gives us. It might be called even table talk, and Jesus gives us some advice at the table. It's not really a parable in the sense in which we are normally used to reading a parable. That is what we might say colloquially, a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But it really is just a piece of advice that our Lord gives us. And that's what this parable has within it. It begins in verse 1, and we'll jump down to verse 7. So let's look at verse 1, because that sets really the scene for us. It came to pass that when he entered into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread, that is at the table, that they were watching him. Watching him means that they were observing him carefully, and the reason was because they wanted to catch him in something that he might do amiss. But just as is the case today, they were watching him, but he was watching them as well. And so we come down to verse 7, where we read in this particular that Jesus told also a parable when he noticed that he, said, he marked, I think the ASV says he marked, that they chose out the chief seats, that is at the table. He said, when you're invited of any man to a marriage feast, sit not down in the chief seat, lest happily a more honorable man than you is invited of him. And he that invited you and him will come and say to you, give this man place, and then you shall with shame begin to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, sit down in the lowest place, that when he that invited you may come, he may say to you, friend, go up higher, and then you will have glory or honor in the presence of all that sit at meet with you. For everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and everyone that humbles himself shall be exalted. A couple of things that are pretty pressing as far as really grasping the picture of the parable, and that is to see how they actually ate a meal in the first century, just as they do in Oriental countries. They sat at tables that were very low to the ground, so they sat on the ground. They sat on cushions, reclined on cushions. Normally, they would recline on their left side, just as in the picture that is here. They would recline on their left side, and they eat with the right hand. And when they have a table that had many people that would sit at it, it would be shaped like a horseshoe, just like right here. So the head of the table, the chief seat at the table, was left at really the apex of that horseshoe. And that was normally reserved at a feast, for example, for a chief rabbi, one of the chief of the Pharisees. And he would sit there, and then in descending order of importance, they would sit at his right hand and left hand. Now, this made it very simple for a person who was serving at the meal to come in, and they'd come into the middle of the tables, and they would be able to serve everybody just from one particular location. And that's what was taking place here. Upon this occasion, we are told in verse 1 that he was invited into the home of one of the rulers of the Pharisees, and that's exactly what was taking place. They were vying for position, honorable position at the table, because that would be at the right hand and left hand, and then in descending order. So that's exactly how it was taking place right there. We might call it table manners, or some people have called it table manners, but really it goes much deeper than that. When we think about table manners, we might think about such things as uh, Amy Vanderbilt's uh, Book of Etiquette, and here's how you sit at the table, and uh, you eat with your right hand and you have your left in your lap. Uh, don't talk with your mouth full. Uh, use your napkin. Uh, wait till you swallow your food to drink. Don't reach over someone else to get food and that kind of thing. But this is really much more than about table manners. This is about an orientation of life. It is an, about an approach to life that is marked by humility. And that's exactly what our Lord wants to teach us this morning in verses 7 through 11. A life that is marked by or oriented around humility. I read an article not long ago, just about a month ago, in the Epic Times. I don't know if you get the Epic Times or not. It's a great paper, but they had an article about humility, and they said humility is really being lost in America completely. Because our culture encourages different character traits that vie against or go against or fly in the face of humility. That is, we honor people who are narcissistic, self-centered, we have people who have an entitlement mentality. 
Arguing has become a national pastime. You can see road rage where people exhibit all of their anger. And people don't think anything about stepping on top of someone else to go up higher on the ladder. That's exactly what's taking place in our society. That was what was going on in our Lord's society also. And this particular parable absolutely destroys any concept that those things bring to mind. It's a parable about humility. And in order to go up in the kingdom of God, you must go down. And so let's notice several things regarding, number one, we'll talk about the principle of humility. What is the basic principle? We'll look at the basic concepts of how to be humble, that is, how to do it, and then the pattern of humility. So let's think about those three specific points for just a moment. Let's think about the principle of humility. Let's pick up the last verse of the parable, and that would be, everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. That was a difficult lesson for them to learn, just as it is difficult for us. But the apostles remembered it well, and it was mentioned in several statements that Jesus made, that is a very similar comments, in the rest of the gospel record. For example, it's in Matthew chapter 20, I think it's chapter 23. He makes that same comment. He makes it also in Luke chapter 18 at the end of another parable, Everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The apostles remembered it well. All of the apostles, whether it be Paul, James, Peter, they all remark on humility as being a characteristic of those who are in the kingdom of God. Paul will say, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, if there is therefore any exhortation in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any tender mercies and compassion. Make full my joy that you be of the same mind, having the same love, that you be of one accord of one mind. Now listen to this. Doing nothing through faction or through vainglory. What's faction? It means selfishness. The Greek word means selfishness, erythia. Being self-centered. Doing nothing through faction or vainglory, that is, selfish ambition. That is, ambition that disregards what other people feel and how other people are viewing it. That's the idea. Doing nothing through faction or through vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, each counting the other better than himself. Not looking each of you to his own things, but also each of you to the things of others. That's a pretty strong mark underneath what our Lord had to say, isn't it? Or how about James, chapter 4 and verse 10? James will say, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he, he is the one who will exalt you. I like the way Peter puts it perhaps best. He says, clothe yourselves with humility. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility to serve one another. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. So the principle of humility is very simple, it's very clear, it is underscored in many passages throughout the New Testament, but what is the pathway to it? How do we achieve that? How are we able to come to a humble state of mind? How are we able to practice humility? And what's the starting point? Where do we begin? Well, I want to make a few suggestions, biblical comments thinking about the pathway to humility. And there are three things that I want us to focus upon. Number one, our physical and bodily limitations should cause us to be humble. Our physical and bodily limitations. You know, yesterday, I was 34 years old. I turned around today, I'm 64. I thought, what's happened? Spent hospital time. I thought, well, you know, Time is not mine forever. And we all have these problems in life. We have disease. We can't stave off all disease. We can't stave off all problems, that is, physical ailments that we have. Many of us have many more problems than I've ever had. And one day, death will camp right at my door. That's a pretty sobering thought to think about. And it'll camp at your door as well. And we'll leave this life, and that'll be it. That's why Solomon would say this, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. 
it's better to go into the house of mourning, sadness, than into the house of mirth, happiness. Because that's the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Better to go into the house of mourning than into the house of mirth, for that's the end of all men. The living will lay it to the heart. That is to say, it's better to take life soberly, a little bit more serious than simply flitting through life, not thinking about really the purpose of why we're here. And that's why also David would write in the Psalms, chapter 103, he says, like as a father pities his children, so Jehovah pities those that fear him. He knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, and he flourishes as the flower of the grass, but the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. And that's life, isn't it? That's the physical ailments that we have. Think about also this. When we think about our place in the universe and our place in all of the wide world, you cannot help but feel a strong sense of insignificance, can't you? When I was younger, one of my favorite little hobbies was astronomy. And I had my mother bought me a telescope and it had a tripod. And I would go out in the yard in Chandler. Arizona, and I would look at the stars, and I had the star charts, and I had all, all these things memorized at one point. That was many, many years ago. And I would look at the stars, but you know, I th one of the things that struck me was that it makes you very reflective about life and about where I am in life, and who am I? So for example, the sun is 93 million miles away from the Earth. That's the nearest star. 93 million miles. It's hard to even comprehend actually impossible for me to comprehend. But the nearest star to the Earth is Alpha Centauri, outside the sun. Alpha Centauri. It's near the Southern Cross, which is a, a constellation in the sky. Alpha Centauri is 3.45 light years away. That's the nearest star. 3.45 light years away. What is a light year? Well, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So how far would light travel in one minute? 60 seconds. We'll multiply 186,000 times 60. How far would it travel in one hour? How far would, well, we're way beyond any kind of mathematical ability I have. And that, but how far would it travel in one year at that rate? That's impossible for me to conceive. And then that's one light year. Then three and a half light years away, that's the nearest star to us. The Milky Way galaxy in which we live is 100,000 light years across span, 100,000. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is made up of one billion stars. And when I think about these facts of life, I'm driven like David to say, as he did in Psalms 8, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the sun and the moon are the sun and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. Our physical insignificance and our physical inabilities and our weaknesses ought to cause everybody to have a large dose of humility. That's number one. To think about life. Now our trouble is too frequently that we don't take time to think. We don't take time to do anything except iPhones, you know, and that was one of the things I should have mentioned in table manners about no iPhones, iPhones on the table, right? But, you know, we, we're always on the iPhone. We're always doing something. We don't, we don't ever have time to stop and think about our place in the world. Here's something else that ought to help us to remind ourselves to be humble or one of humble spirit, and that is our mental limitations. Our mental limitations should keep us very humble. Our mental limitations, if we took all of the knowledge that the world has, all the knowledge that men have accumulated from the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, until today, and put it in one storehouse, that would be so infinitesimally small compared to all the possibility of knowledge that there is. That's how much there is to know. So that is a huge, huge number. It should make us to be and help us to remind ourselves to be 
humble. And it brings us to mind that we should be humble because of our mental incapacity, thinking about all that we cannot know and we'll never know. Now, this is exactly what Solomon addressed in his book, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Humility. I want you to notice a couple of things that he said. One of them was this in Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I think in verse 7, actually, it says, is the beginning of knowledge. And then fools despise wisdom and instruction. But when you go to chapter 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then we have to learn, he tells us in the next line, about Almighty God. That's the beginning point. Respect authority. That's exactly what a society, modern, does not have. Respect authority. For authority, and that means respecting other people, respecting people in positions of authority, but most of all, respecting God. Respecting authority. If you can't respect authority, there's not a beginning place to learn anything. You might know some facts, but there's not any real wisdom at all. If you can't get along with people, then how's the world going to go around? Basically, right? That's exactly what Solomon has in mind. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, our Lord tells us that each individual is of inestimable value. And he tells us that, and we need to know that we are to love ourselves. So we are told this, what shall a man be profited if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. The answer, of course, is obvious. However... However, excessive self-love is a vice. And I will say it this way. It is a deadly vice, excessive self-love. It leads to narcissism. It leads to mentalities that makes it unfriendly to other people and gives you a haughty spirit. Well, what happens when that takes place? Well, that means a person loses an adequate perception of his own self, of his own place in the universe, of his place in God's kingdom. He, uses, he loses the perspective of reality, and he comes in conflict with reality because we place too high of a value on our own selves. And it causes many problems. That's exactly what takes place. And so that's why Solomon would go on to say, in Proverbs 16 and verse 26, he tells us we need to be humble, humble people. That's the idea, humility, because we don't want to lose the proper perspective of where we are in life in comparison to the rest of the world and the rest of people around us. There are many examples that you can note regarding people who lost that perspective, and sometimes they did it in the name of humility. One of the persons that I think about is Socrates. Socrates from ancient Rome, B.C. period of time. Socrates was said to be the wisest man in all of Athens. Now, was he really wise? Here's what he would do. He would go around in the streets of Athens, and he would corner some unsuspecting person and then start plaguing him with all of these questions that were really unanswerable. Here's one question, and just kind of machine gun these questions at him. He couldn't answer, the, the person couldn't answer the questions, and then he would feel pretty good about himself, and he'd walk off. I thought, that's humility, but that's really humility now come to pride. And sometimes we can wear our humility in a prideful fashion, just as Socrates did. One of the figures of Roman history, and all of, the, all of the emperors could fit into the same category, that I think about is Nero. Nero, the sixth emperor from the time, if we're count, counting from Julius Caesar on, the sixth emperor, he came to the throne in 54, and he left, and he committed suicide in 68. Nero was one <clears throat> ugly nasty character. He murdered his own mother, Agrippina. He kicked his wife to death. She was pregnant with his child. She, he kicked her to death. Popeye was her name. And he was filled with himself because people who get in positions of power frequently do. And he thought of himself as some great orator and some great, uh, he would read poetry, but really a great 
musician. He played the lyre. So he would go and he would stand on stage and he wanted everybody to applaud him. And he made a rule. <laughs> I think, by the way, before we get there, he was actually performing in Greece, in Athens, Greece, when he heard the news that Judea was now in a state of upheaval and burning, 66 AD, and he sent one of his generals who was with him at the time named Vespasian to take care of it, just go take care of the business for me. He wanted to perform on stage. But here's one of the, things, one of the rules he had. He said, well, you know what? He said, if anybody leaves the building, leaves the audience, <laughs> leaves the audience while I'm speaking, well, then what? You couldn't leave. It's too bad if you needed to go to the restroom or something. Now, how is that? That is, if he's going to perform, anybody who leaves during this performance, you're going to be punished, even by death. People are so filled with themselves. And that's exactly what Nero was about. That's what a lot of people who are in positions of power are about. Very opposite. That's what the world actually calms people to be, it encourages people to be that way, and narcissistic, and filled with themselves, a sense of entitlement, and that's what I mean by it. So when we actually contemplate our mental incapabilities, or our limitations is a better word to say it, when we contemplate our mental limitations, it should make us very humble people. But most of all, most of all, when we contemplate our moral not simply weaknesses, but failures, that should cause us to be humble people. Paul was always conscious of where he had come from, always reminded himself and others of what he had done. The greatest apostle, and yet he made comments upon several occasions, for example, in 1 Timothy 1 and 15, he said, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. 1 Corinthians 15, I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet or suitable to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not found vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Isn't that a marvelous statement? Always conscious of where he had come from. And he tells us in a poignant passage to be exactly the same way. This is Titus 3. Put them in mind to be in subjection to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready unto every good work, to speak evil of no man, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing all meekness toward all men. For what? We also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hated one another. But what? But when the kindness of God our Savior, His love toward man appeared, not by works done in righteousness, which we've done ourselves, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. A beautiful passage this to remind us that always bear in our hearts where we have failed, and that should help us in dealing with other people as well. One of the things that has plagued my mind through the years is how church problems have erupted. And frequently, it comes about because of self-centeredness. I went to Marlowe, it was in 1992, started preaching in Marlowe, Oklahoma, right up the road. I had not preached a sermon yet. It was the first Sunday there. And I was going around shaking people's hands. And there's an old gentleman, I've forgotten his name. Good thing, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. I held up my hand to shake it. He sat there, he looked at me, he said, I'm not shaking your hand. I don't shake the hands of false teachers. I said, well, I haven't preached anything yet. What are you talking about? I haven't started. I thought, well, some people are born in the objective case and the kick it of mood, aren't they? I thought, wow, that's incredible. That's just waiting for a fight to happen. He's going to drop the hat to start it. I thought, well, and that's how a lot of people are, unfortunately, in the churches. We had a horse when I was growing up. One of the first horses we had, Lane will appreciate this. 
This was a kind of a well-sized pony. I was just a kid. I was in seventh grade. My brother was in third grade. And this was kind of a mouse-colored little horse. We called him Peanuts. But Peanuts, someone had taken Peanuts to a rail, apparently. You can kind of tell when a horse has been mistreated. And tied him up to the rail and beat him. Because, boy, you raised your hand, and, boy, he was going to tear things apart right there. Well, we bought that little pony, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> when you tried to touch his leg, back leg, he would kick. And I don't mean a kick like trying to kick a fly. You can hear the wind. Whew. And it was like breaking bones trying to kick. So Scott got that horse. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> Not my horse. I thought, well, a lot of people are like peanuts, you know. They're just like tied up. Someone's beat them or whatever. I don't know where. But they're ready to kick. And as soon as you touch them, boom. And that's the way they go. All of that is reflective of the point that we forget where we were and what great sins God has forgiven in my life. Why would I be that way? Why would I be kickative about things? Why would I be in an objective case? Why would I enjoy a pastime of arguing and bickering? Why would I enjoy that? Well, if we would be more perceptive of my own sins and you have your own, and where we have been and what God has forgiven to bring you in, we might be a little more forgiving of each other and more loving. So that's the way to humility, a pathway to it. But at last, I want to mention finally, there is a pattern in the New Testament. And the pattern, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ. This occurs in Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to tie it with John chapter 13. Now, Luke 22, John 13 are both surrounding the episode of the Last Supper that he has. John 13 gives a, a lengthy description of it, but Luke 22 in preparation thereof. Verses 25 and following of Luke 22. This is the last week of our Lord's life. He's actually at the nth hour where he's about to give his life for that which he has preached and for the fact that he's the Son of God, and they're going to kill him for it. Earlier, when he was going to Jerusalem, we are told in Luke 9, that he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, and they that followed him were afraid. I take it that they were afraid or fearful because he was so firm and resolute, and he was sober-minded about the things that were before him. With that in his mind giving his life for the sins of the world, what were the disciples doing when they came to the table? The one that we saw a rendition of at the first slide, they were arguing about the same thing as this parable gives, positions of honor. They were arguing about who is going to sit at the right hand, who is going to be the left hand. Remember, even the mother of James and John had come earlier to him and said, Grant that my sons might sit at one at your right hand, one at your left in your kingdom. That would be the positions of greatest honor. And he comes to the Last Supper with the sins of the world on his mind, and the disciples are arguing about who has what seat at the table. And he stops, and he asks this question, which is greater, he that sits at table or he that serves? Well, the answer is obvious. It's he that sits at table is greater than he that serves the one at table. They couldn't say anything. He took off his outer garment. He put on a towel, girded it about his waist, took a bowl, and began to wash the disciples' feet. He says, I'm among you as one who serves. Serving. Do you know that they were humiliated at that particular juncture? Into silence. They didn't even know what to say as he washed one by one the disciples' feet. Our world today does not believe that to go up, you must go down and be humble-minded. Our world does not believe it. And the world at that time did not believe it. Our Lord came into the world, however, lowly in a manger, that is a feeding trough in a barn. And he died a criminal's death on the cross before he left the world. The way to go up is to go down, to be humble-minded, serving one another. That's the lesson of the parable. Very opposite of what the world believes and what the world wants you to think. 
And if we're not careful, the world kind of creeps in and seeps in on our souls, and we begin to buy for position at the table that is in life. Let's be humble-minded servants of Christ. If you want to obey the gospel now, now's the time to do it. We stand and sing the invitation song. You can come to the front. We will assist you in any way that we can while we stand and sing right now.